last time this was for fun. Now it's topical. Projectile motion. Projectile motion. Not projectile motion. Projectile motion. Well, that was a lot of fun. Welcome everybody to today's walkthrough. In this week's experiment, we're going to be looking at two-dimensional motion, projectile motion in particular, where there's only one acceleration, and that acceleration is vertical, it's due to gravity. Now the main point of this week's lab is to focus on prediction, being able to use the equations that we've studied in lab and lecture. We want to use these equations in order to predict where a ball is going to land once we've launched it. Now this is something that we as humans all seem to have a sort of natural intuitive understanding for. This is kind of an opportunity for us to bring together these two ideas where we're doing the math and making predictions but tying it in with what we do internally. For example, we've known how to use projectile motion for years and years and years. Nobody ever on the basketball court stops and works out the equations to make sure that they get that three-point shot. By contrast, many uses in the modern world rely on our being able to predict exactly where something's going to land once we've launched it. So before we get into any further details, let's take a look at this week's pre-lab activity. Again, for this pre-lab, we're going to be using acceleration without G. You've got your three axes, X, Y, and Z. And then again, you'll see over here the orientation with X, Y, and Z coming out of your uh, phone. and what you will do is you'll simply go for a sort of a speed walk for a few steps and then give yourself a big hop. We're looking for a moment while you're in that big hop that shows constant acceleration downward. So simply hold your device vertically like so, push play, and then as the data starts you go and have a hop in there. Stop the data and then take a look at your results. And so now with the data you notice that even though there are some wobbles along the x-axis and some wobbles along the z-axis, but they mostly stay around zero. There's no clear acceleration. And here you see 9.8 meters per second squared while flying in the air. And so what you're demonstrating in this pre-lab is that you only experience acceleration due to gravity while you're in the middle of your hop and that acceleration along the other two axes is approximately an average out to be zero confirming that your motion forward remains constant while you're in uh, undergoing projectile motion. So projectile motion is a continuation of your studies of the basics of motion such as constant velocity and constant acceleration situations. And so you see we've got the kinematic equations here that we've selected from the full set of kinematic equations. One for the horizontal axis for constant velocity is zero acceleration and one for the vertical motion which is undergoing constant acceleration due to gravity. We use this equation, we use this equation, this is what we're going to be using to predict the landing of the sphere in your lab station. By now you're pretty well familiar with these kinematic equations just getting a little bit more practice with these different scenarios so I'd like to take a few minutes and talk to you a little bit about two-dimensional motion itself, the vectors. So let's take for example a segment of motion from an object that's undergoing projectile motion. Here we see it's following this parabolic looking path and if we zoom in on that particular vector we see that there's a little bit of it that's going in the horizontal where the acceleration is zero and then we have some of it that's going along the vertical where the acceleration is negative g downward. And so the main question that we have is what is the value of this speed here and this speed here at that instantaneous point in time? To do that, we rely on our old algebra tools, so Katoa, many of you would have already experienced, so sine, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is opposite over adjacent. And in this figure, we remind ourselves that for a right triangle, and that's what this applies to, we have an angle, the adjacent side, the opposite side, and the hypotenuse. So let's zoom in now on one vector and figure out how to get the length of these sides. Well, if we draw a vector 
we'll call it A, and we recognize that there's an angle between A and the positive x direction, that's kind of the convention. Then we say, okay, well then I've got myself almost the makings of a right triangle. If I drop a line from the tip of the vector to the x-axis, that's going to map out a little length of vector that goes only along the x direction. We'll call that a component, A, in the x direction. We do the same thing to the vertical, and we get A in the y direction. We call these components of the parent vector. And the question is, how long are these? The length of these correspond to the magnitude of whatever that vector represents. If it's velocity, it's the magnitude of the velocity. If it's acceleration, it's the acceleration. So we start out with our statement for sine, cosine, tangent. And we notice that the AX is the adjacent leg to this right triangle that we have drawn here. And that means that we can write cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. OK, good where this absolute value gives the length or the magnitude of the parent vector. So if I rewrite this so that it's not having fractions in it, then I have the length of a sub x is equal to the length of a times the cosine of theta. Now, the reason that this works and makes sense is because if you remember from studying sines and cosines, you'll recognize that the value of the sine and the cosine live between positive and negative 1, so they stay within a magnitude smaller than 1. Another way to think about that is cosine and sine scale the length of this vector, making it shorter to whatever basic the angle you have. And so we can write a sub x, a cosine theta, a sub y, a sine theta, because the sine is the opposite. So there's more to it than this, but we'll cover that in next week's lab walkthrough. For this week's activity, however, we only need these two breakdowns of vectors. At your station, you will find a launcher that's ready to be used to do this experiment. It is a standing mount that you can see that you can adjust the height of it. And as you do so, you'll see that this plumb bob will let you know what your angle of the projectile's uh, orientation is. You want the first steps to be at zero. And if you tighten too high, that will actually go outside the range so you want to make sure that you get that pretty accurate that way the ball stays in place when you're loading it so that you get the most accurate connection between the ball and the launcher that's behind it then you'll adjust it to a slightly different height uh, an angle given to you by your ta it's probably going to be somewhere between zero and ten degrees anything other than that you're going to start getting losing space that's available to you You'll note that there's a short range, medium range, and a long range for the different settings. You only want to go to the short range. We don't have as much space in the lab to go any larger, and uh, we can get sufficient information with that. So only go to the first click when you load this up. When you're ready to load, this will be affixed to the surface of the table using a clamp. You'll load the ball in place here. Make sure that you don't stand in front of it or have anybody stand in front of it. It's unlikely that injuries will occur, but always make sure that it's unloaded while you're doing your measurements and alignment of everything. So you place this into the launcher. You use the packer to push it into place. Remember, the first click is all you need. And then when you're ready, you just simply pull the trigger and it goes flying off. When you are setting up capstone, one thing that you'll need to do is measure the diameter of the launch ball that you'll be using throughout the experiment. To do that, you'll want to use a pair of vernier calipers. So you close that up, and you notice it should be at zero. If it doesn't say zero, hit that zero when it's completely closed. This one's flashing. They don't all flash. And then simply open it up to a little bit larger than the width that you need, and then close that inside in just such a way and it should give you a value. This one is measuring 25.4140 millimeters. So remember, centimeters is what the capstone is going to ask you for. So you want to have 2.541 centimeters in there. Well, it actually gives it to a meter, so it's 0 0.02541. So make sure you get all those decimal places in there. Make sure you adjust all of the settings for the measurements to give you multiple decimal places, five or six decimal places, so that you get the most uh, precise data that you can. Please make sure when you're done with the vernier caliper that you close it and you make sure that it's powered off. On your target, you'll need to lay a piece of the carbon paper. This has got a gray side and a darker black side. And the black side is the side that has the ink. So handle it carefully because you'll get smudge on your fingers. But lay that gently down and when you drop your sphere onto it, it'll leave marks. 
so that you can easily mark them. Make sure that you mark them after each run so that you have a sequence in order, one, two, three, four, something like that, in order to keep track of any progressions in the data, indications that something was getting worse and worse or better and better. With your device set up, like you see here, you have the launcher set to zero degrees and you wanna make sure that it's right on zero. If the launcher is too horizontal, not at the zero, the ball will roll away from the launcher and you won't get the right results. Notice that you've got your photo gate set up here aligned with this. You'll have the setup just similar to what the lab manual describes. And once you start taking data, take the ball, place it in the launcher, load it up no more than close range. Anything else is too, there's not a space to work with, plus why create extra work for yourself. And then you pull the trigger and it'll launch into the catching box and you just simply repeat that the six times that are in the lab manual. It's a quick thing. Should be about three, three and a half uh, meters per second. And wash, rinse, repeat for those multiple times. Once you have the average speed worked out for the launch muzzle speed, you'll want to calculate the initial velocity, both horizontal and vertical, based off of the angle that your TA gives you. So you'll adjust this with the knob and slowly move it to the angle. And so this is hanging at five degrees. And first thing you want to test to see is, is it in the right place? You can go ahead and move the photo gate out of the way because the muzzle velocity is a fixed value for the short range, or at least it's a pretty consistent value. And then we'll test to see if we're in a good position. And you'll do one launch. I've got the box on the floor. And it barely clears this. It may be worthwhile. As as a matter of fact, you'll notice that it landed just shy of the box. It hit the box going down. So the box is at kind of where the landing point is. You probably have about a few inches of play here, and you can move this closer to that uh, in that case. Things to consider when before you actually make your measurements. The next task is to work out what the height is. And if you'll notice, the meter stick doesn't quite go as high as the launcher muzzle spot. You You've got a target here that pinpoints exactly where the center of the ball will be when it leaves the muzzle. So this is your reference point, and you can measure the distance between the surface of the table and that point to the best of your ability. And then you can measure the height relative to the floor of that same point on the surface. You want to really make sure that you've got a good vertical connection here and that you're, you're using a meter stick that's not bent in. Once you've predicted the landing distance, you want to measure from the launcher position here to the edge of the table. And then, as it can be measured from the side of the table and measure out to the landing point, at which point you'll place your target and do your runs, see how good you predicted that landing point. Okay, so now that you have an idea of what's going on with the lab, let's just take a moment and talk about the worksheet. There is a minor glitch in the system with D2L and when it renders images from the files that we upload. And so there will be formatting problems if you try to print it directly from the renderer in D2L. So please download your worksheet before you print it. That way you can print it in the proper formatting. There's a couple of objects on there that get moved around in D2L that you want to make sure is in the right spot. So it's a little bit easier for you to work with and for us to grade. So when you arrive at lab, if you print out the paper, you'll make your recordings on that. If you have a device that you can actually write on directly, that's fine too. And your submission is going to be a completed worksheet, calculations made based off of your measurements made on your own personal target, and the summary that is supposed to be about half a page. Now you want to be careful with this. You don't want to get too carried away. We're not trying to really reproduce a short lab analysis, but you do want to comment on the results. You want to talk about your percent errors and your percent differences that you calculate throughout the lab and use those to help validate, justify, or declare something not valid. You don't have to talk about the procedure. You don't have to do anything introductory. You just want to talk about the results of your lab in a scientific way. It should be more than just a few sentences. So anything less than about a quarter of a page, you may want to rethink adding a little bit more because we expect there to be a little bit more heft in that analysis that you're doing in the summary. But again, don't want to get too carried away. It doesn't need to be too long. Just make sure that your worksheets are nice, clean, and organized. <coughs> 
Well, that does it for this week's lab walkthrough. If you have any questions, as always, you can talk to me, you can talk to your TAs or your LAs uh, and amongst, your, uh, amongst each other. Before you leave the lab, please make sure that you tidy up your station, that you turn off all the equipment, including the 850 interface. And in this week's lab, make sure that you turn off the vernier calipers. We don't want to run those batteries. Um, also, please make sure that you scoot your chairs back under the benches so that it's easier walk path as the students come in from the next, for the next class. As always, if you have any questions that's going on in the lecture, you can always talk to any one of us, but you can also go to the Physics Help Center. And so, until next time, we'll see you in the lab. Bye. Holy cow. <laughs> Overkill. <laughs>